everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. We're come rain, shine, or anything in between. We're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Baltasar, and welcome to another exciting weekly recap. This week, we're going over the preseason All Big 12 honors, the Volley Cats and the Soccer Cats. But let's just dive straight into it with the preseason All Big 12 picks. Although they're just two honorable mentions. Which, you know, given that both of them are transfers, I can kind of understand why they would be honorable mentions, uh, even though... Max A. Smith is first team. And Hunter Dickinson is first team. I, uh, and X- Dickinson's different, though. Yeah. And also, <laughs> technically, LJ Cryer is a transfer, even though he's transferring in conference. But... Yeah, I'm it's, just saying it's it. a poor excuse, yeah. but... It's not unprecedented. Yeah, it's not unpre- unprecedented. It's not horribly unknown, but... Arthur Kaluma and Tyler Perry are on the honorable mention team. Uh, the website says that they're the first cats to be named to the preseason on Big 12 since Barry Brown and Dean Wade. That tracks. It actually does. Um, I'm trying to think about who would have justified it since then. Nigel Pack, there wasn't enough of a body of work to really justify it in his sophomore year. Xavier Sneed? It's probably your best argument since then. It only moves up that time frame by a year. Wasn't KJ Newcomer? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Which is weird that he wasn't a preseason all-conference pick then, but oh well. What can you do? Yeah, what can you do? But yeah, Arthur Kaluma, King Arthur, and then Tyler Perry were the two honorable mention selections. Uh... Just to go over the rest of the team, it's uh, the first teams: Hunter Dickinson, Dejuan Harris, L.J. Cryer, Emmanuel Miller, and Max Asmus. Uh, so, two targets in the portal that we were going after ended up not going to. Oh well, what happened? It, it's what happens. <laughs> yeah, it happens sometimes. That's all right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, these are also all really quality picks. Hunter Dickinson was the number one transfer pretty much unanimously. Yeah. Uh, Dewan Harris was pretty good last year as well, and I think he's earned that first team nod. LJ Cryer has been really good. Uh, Manuel Miller has been a little overshadowed by... Eddie? No. Well, Eddie's not even there anymore. Well, Eddie, no, he's not. Yeah, and then... Uh, Gosh, why am I forgetting his name? Uh, Mike Miles. Oh, yeah. uh, he's been overshadowed by him, and Max Asmus was a borderline unanimous number two in the transfer portal. So can't really go wrong with any of those picks. But it's of course you still wish that you get a guy in there. It probably would have been Perry, but you know we'll, I'll settle for him being on the uh, postseason All Conference first team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am kind of surprised that Naquan Tomlin isn't on this list. Yeah, I he, think that's the biggest surprise to me. Yeah, because they find room for Jalen Bridges, Ray J. Dennis, and Jacoby Walter uh, from Baylor, uh, Jamal Shedd from Houston, Kevin McCuller uh, from KU, Dylan DeSue, Tyrese Hunter, and Dylan Mitchell from Texas, and then Jesse Edwards at West Virginia. But no Naquan Tomlin. That is a huge slight, I think. Uh, I imagine that it's just going to be a little extra fuel to the fire for Naquan, but I'm if you ask them in interviews, they'll say they don't care and they don't look at that stuff. I mean, there's there's no other way to really approach preseason stuff other than saying that you don't care about it, even if you do. Yeah. Uh, so I imagine if Naquan cares at all, it's just going to be extra motivation. Uh, so, But still, from a fan perspective, I, I was surprised to not see Naquan make it as an honorable mention. Yeah, I was too. Uh, Last thing I want to say is that I forgot that Tyler Perry shot like 41 from three. (laughs) Yeah, and people, including us, keep forgetting that uh, Tyler Perry shot an incredible uh, um, rate from three-point range uh, last year. And he did that averaging 17.1 points per game and 41-ish percent. He did all that in the... Absolute dead last in pace offense uh, in the entire country. North Texas was the slowest team in the entire country. And Tyler Perry still averaged 17 and made 41% of his shots, a lot of it being off the bounce as one of the sole playmakers on that team. So, pretty incredible uh, for 
the stats that he's put up. And he's primarily going to be shooting... He's going to shoot most of his shots from from three. Uh, from three. On nearly two-thirds of his shots at North Texas in his North Texas career uh, were threes. So, And his percentage hardly drops off. And he's 43% from the field and 41.3% from three. But I keep... I think it's important to hammer home just how good Perry can be in this offense. We saw some flashes of that over in the Middle East. And I think, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think, I, I'm, I think I'm, the point is Tyler Perry good. Yes, I, that was the point, but it, more succinctly than I could have hoped to. <laughs> and Tyler Perry is just going to be a problem this year. Uh, we'll talk about him even more when we get to the uh, preview episode for men's and women's cats ball. But in about two weeks. Yeah, for now. Very excited about Perry. Now we can move into the sports that actually have happened so far. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from our sponsor. And we are back. Welcome to the weekly recap for the Aggieville Alley Cats. Diving straight into the first volleyball match of two. Uh, We mentioned last week that beating Baylor was big. Uh, we played them the very next night, did not beat them, <laughs> but it was at least competitive at the beginning, <laughs> where K-State ended up falling 3-1, to one, losing the first set 29-27, to second set was lost 25-20, uh, K-State then pretty much dominated the third set 25-16 before basically getting turned around and dominated right back, uh, 25-17 the final set. Uh, Baylor's a really good team, and we mentioned that before. Obviously, they outscored us, but they barely outscored us and outkilled us. They, The only area in which they did not outdo us, basically, would be in digs and blocks. Digs by one and blocks by six. Yeah. We may be one of the best. I think at this point, we are verifiably one of the best blocking teams in the Big 12. I think... It's either us or TCU. Yeah. And Jason Mansfield went on record uh, two nights ago from the time this releases uh, saying that he thinks K-State's the best blocking team in the Big 12. And, well, he should think that. He's the coach. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, I mean, this was a pretty closely contested game despite losing 3-1. Uh, hitting percentages were very close. K-State hitting 2-2-4 to Baylor's 2-3-6. Uh, of course, the blocks were skewed in K-State's favor. Aces were skewed a little bit in Baylor's favor. Other than that, everything else was pretty close. Uh, Diggs was separated by just one in favor of K-State. Uh, assists separated by just one in favor of Baylor. Kills was a separation of five in favor of Baylor. This was a really well-played game from K-State, uh, considering that they had just knocked off Baylor uh, the night before uh, this match was played. So yes, they do drop this, but they split the series at Baylor, uh, one to one, and put up a really good fight in uh, match number two. So can't really complain too much about that trip. I think. I think you. I think you're pretty happy coming away with one uh, match win and another competitive match. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you'll you'll especially take some of these individual performances. Uh, Cindy Bolding getting ten. Ten and a half, we'll call it eleven. We'll just round up from now on. Uh, and hitting three fifty seven, uh, Aaliyah Carter hitting two fifty five, getting twenty three points. Shaley Myers not a great hitting percentage, but still scoring eleven. And you know this was encouraging because I kind of expected it. I didn't expect it. I was ready to see us kind of get smoked as revenge. Um, but we didn't. We actually played quite well, which, you know, we take those. In fact, we don't only take those. We like those a lot, actually. Uh, But in terms of the blocks, uh, of course, Brenna Schmidt was the leader, which is a a new leader, I believe. Normally, it's Sydney Boulding. Yeah, although Sydney Bolden was just behind with five uh, to Brenna Schmidt, six. Uh, but the, the development of Brenna Schmidt's been kind of unexpected mm-hmm. from this season. Uh, when I went to the uh, preseason scrimmage they had to help break in the new arena, uh, she played a bit but didn't look great. But she's made some significant strides in what's only been two months 
uh, it seems like, or at least they found different ways to use her, maybe. Uh, which, granted, the whole team just looks a lot better, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, they've really, really settled in to what Jason Mansfield wants to run offensively and defensively. Everyone seems a lot more comfortable in their roles mm-hmm. right now. Um, it's a different team yeah. from the beginning of the year. Yeah, I'd say especially Bolding and Clinton. Clinton has been fantastic these uh, um, last few games, uh, and she's going to be a problem. So we're going to lose Aaliyah Carter, I think, either this year or next year, but uh, Clinton should be able to step up just fine and fill the void. And uh, if you want proof positive of that, just look towards the Iowa State game, which was the next matchup against number 25 in the country, Iowa State. They pretty well got handled by by K State. 25 20, 25 16, then 25 18. A clean sweep where not much of the game looked very competitive. And it kind of looked after halfway through the second set, Iowa State's spirit had been broken, which that's a shame. <laughs> yeah. This was one of the most, com- I think it was the most complete volleyball match that K State's played all year. And he did it against a top 25 team. Absolutely. I mean, this was a really, really inspiring performance. A clean sweep of a rival uh, at home to help build energy. Everybody looked really into it, and everybody was playing at their best. Um, Anaya Clinton and Leah Carter both were really good. Uh, Ezzy Sholshevsky was really good in this one. Uh, Bolding was good. Shaley Myers uh, unexpectedly had four... Um, blocks in this game, including at least one or two uh, solo blocks, uh, and a couple of a couple of them were huge, uh, resulting in a in a points. So, really, really, really big performances all around uh, for most of K State. Lauren Hinkle added a service ace. Um, service wise, we were doing fantastic. I thought uh, we were even when we weren't getting an ace. We had six aces on the night, but. Uh, we were making Iowa State very uncomfortable on reception, and we were doing a really great job there. Of course, we did a great job blocking again. Iowa State had some blocks, but uh, we um, controlled there still. We led them 8-6 to six in blocks. Mackenzie Morris had 21 digs, and I think now is the conference leader in digs per set at 4.75, which is really a, a fantastic rate. And... Uh, she continues to just be so, 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 so good uh, on the back line. And this was just an all-around fantastic performance. I, I don't think there's anybody you can complain about uh, from this game. Uh, Bolding and Clinton were both great on blocks as well. Clinton was just all-around. This was her career game, this, I think. This was a, the game that you and I just kind of looked at each other and was like, all right, this is mean. Like, this yeah. is bullying. <laughs> yeah, it, it did feel like she was bullying Iowa State at times, which, keep going. But <laughs> uh, she, she was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, Carter still had a great game, but Anaya Clinton, I think, was really the star of the show offensively. Uh, um, no, and again, that's no disrespect to Leah Carter or Sydney Boulding, who also had a really efficient offensive night with seven kills. I don't think any errors, uh, but Clinton was just so, so good uh, throughout the entire night. Uh, yeah, Boulding was seven kills on 13 attempts. Uh, Clinton uh, hitting 348 on 23 attempts, had 12 kills and just four errors. Uh, really, really nice stuff uh, from Anaya Clinton. She just looked very powerful. She had. She still had a few where she mishits a little bit and hits straight into the block, and that uh, cost her a couple times. But it was less than what we've seen uh, all year, and it's been a gradual decrease in that as well. Uh, where there were times early in the year where she wasn't really as playable, but uh, she played the whole time pretty much. I think she may have subbed out a couple of times, but wow, she was really good. I can't say enough good things. Uh, about how Anaya Clinton uh, performed. Yeah. She was awesome. I mean, one of these times, someone's going to go up for a block, and she they're, they're going to hit it wrong, and the fact that she, she hits it so damn hard, she may start breaking fingers. <laughs> like... <laughs> that, that wouldn't shock me at all. But this rise for Anaya Clinton is coming at a good time as we're really hitting our stride uh, as a team right now. Uh, it's been gradually getting better and better. 
Uh, there's been a lot of times where we've looked okay but haven't been able to string points together. But the last couple of wins uh, that we've been able to watch, we've been very good at rallying. Like Iowa State started set two of this match with a 5-0 run. And Mansfield didn't take a timeout, which is kind of a risky maneuver, but it paid off because we went on a uh, sixth oh run Mm -hmm. and uh, completely countered Iowa State and forced them to take a timeout. So huge gamble by Mansfield, but it paid off in dividends. We'd be annoyed with them if it didn't work, but (laughs) it it did work. So what can you say? Bro's ice cold. He doesn't. He does not care. (laughs) That is true. He he is not moved by anything (laughs) on the sideline. Yeah, so massive results for the Volley Cats. Uh, next up is a matchup on Saturday up against UCF, who's receiving votes. Then uh, we'll discuss Thursday at Oklahoma, whenever it's Thursday at Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, which um, I guess for what it's worth, it's worth mentioning now that his uh, brother is the head coach at uh, Oklahoma. Jason which, Mansfield. Yeah, which, yeah Jason, Jason Mansfield's brother. Uh, I I was uh, unaware of that until Brian Smoller uh, shared it on the broadcast because K-State does the best broadcast in the entire country and actually does research. So <laughs> uh, thank you to them. They're, they're so, so, so good at what they do. And it's even made even more evident every time we have to watch an away game. So <laughs> with the exception of BYU. BYU does a pretty good job. Yeah, BYU did a really good job with the soccer game. Which, speaking of... Hmm... K-State women's soccer up against BYU. All right. So, uh, ended up losing 2-0. to zero. Now, if you don't look at the shots, and if you don't look at the shots on goal, you would think, wow, you know, K-State put up, like, a somewhat admirable fight uh, against the, like, number seven team in the country. Uh, it took them until the second half to score, so we must have been doing something right. Uh, Connor, I just... Just just for just for the record, uh, here, how many uh, how many shots did uh, BYU have, and then how many did K State have? I'll say K State's first for dramatic effect. Okay. Uh, K State had six shots and one on goal in this game, which is not fantastic. And BYU matched with thirty eight shots and fourteen of them on goal. I will let that speak for itself. What do you even say to that, man? I say it's indicative of fantastic goalkeeping. By Sheaf, yeah. By Sheaf. is good. The fact that BYU, again, it, it kind of does matter. They didn't score until the 76th minute, given how many shots they were putting up. But K-State was doing a really good job of forcing uh, poor shots. And when they did get good shots, Sheaf was locked in. So genuinely, this was a fantastic defensive performance, despite losing 2-0. Yeah, we just I, score. They, this was the same BYU team that, in their prior match, beat Iowa State 7-0 and put up a similar amount of shots with, like, 20 shots on goal or something like that. And uh, that says a lot about K-State and uh, their defense. It also says a lot about their offense. But... Uh, BYU also got yeah. 13 corners. Yeah, they uh 13 corners. K-State had zero. Uh, not a lot to like there. But um, Murphy Sheaf did, I think, tie the Big 12 record for saves in a game, which is 12. Uh, so that's that's nice for her, I guess. But they didn't score until the 76th minute, and they scored again in the 83rd. Um, but we didn't really expect to go into this game and win. No. I don't think that was what anybody expected. No. And K-State managed to limit the damage pretty effectively which is a nice change. The defense has definitely been the calling card of this team at the expense of any semblance of offense. Yep. It's been one of the worst offensive soccer teams I've ever seen, truthfully. Uh, I think they have nine goals all year, and four yep. of them came in their first match. Yep. So, suboptimal in my view. Uh, but the defense has been all right, at least. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a good way to describe it. Is that the defense has been all right? I that's all I really want to say about the BYU game. <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, then the West Virginia game. West Virginia having a strangely down year. Uh, they're six. Well, they were five, seven, and three coming into this match. 
Uh, it took them until the 80th minute to score, but we still end up losing 1-0. Again, the, the shot differential here is very telling. Yeah, uh, K-State puts up nine shots, two on goal. West Virginia puts up 28 on goal. Uh, so, I mean, they were definitely shooting at a higher rate. Most of their shots weren't fantastic, uh, save for a few, and a lot of the ones that Sheaf collected on goal were pretty easy. Um, just a, a handful that were really, truly threatening. Um, but I was hoping that we could at least get a point out of this match. Uh, losing outright really dampens our chances of uh, making it to the postseason. Um, but we do still have KU and Iowa State, who are right there near the bottom with us. Uh, so if we can beat them, the um, last team, or I think that we we beat Houston, who's one spot ahead of us, and we have KU and Iowa State left, who take up the two spots behind us. Mm-hmm. So if we beat the two of KU and Iowa State, and a few things fall our way, there is a chance that we still are able to sneak into the Big 12 tournament and making postseason will be good experience again. But it's important to just get there uh, for now. But still pretty uninspiring uh, performance. Uh, West Virginia, despite being in a down year, has an oddly decent conference record. Uh, so, but yeah, rough game for K-State. Not a lot to say about it. Uh they didn't really have any semblance of an offense for the most part. No. Uh, most of their shots came from outside the 18-yard box. Uh, granted, they did have a few pretty decent shots from out there. I'll, I'll be fair to them. But uh, you, you'd you ideally like to cr- create some offensive opportunities a little closer at times. And just in general, this just wasn't K-State's best day, and it seems a lot of them haven't been this year. Yep, we've uh, started another goalless streak. This would be the second game in a row. But the last two matches of the year are on Sunday and then the next Monday uh, against the two other squads at the bottom. If you end up winning both of those games, you end up getting six points and maybe, just maybe, you squeak in to the Big 12 tournament. I wouldn't hold my breath. I certainly won't be. It helps that we beat Houston. That is a huge plus. Uh, because they are the one they're a one, one spot, spot ahead. Out. Yeah, they're one spot ahead of us, they're one spot out of the Big Twelve tournament. So getting that win is really big. But we need to take care of business against the two teams that are allegedly worse than us. We will ultimately know when we face them. But if we can beat Iowa State and KU, then, like you said, we might just make it in. But it kind of depends. Beating West Virginia would have been a huge, huge difference maker uh, for that. But we weren't able to take care of business. Even just getting a point and drawing would have been big. And we were nearly able to do that, but we just weren't quite able. Yeah. I mean, that's. I think that pretty well sums it up. Just a lot of... Not, I'm not even going to say close, but no cigars. Just there's no offense. And no offense, but no offense. There's been negative offense, even. Well, te- technically, we if you want to count the own goal, we have 10 goals on the air. Well, I don't <laughs> want to count that because that doesn't count. <laughs> but, yeah, that is pretty much all of the actual news now we get into everyone's favorite which is the wacky segment of the week honor i didn't give you any time to prepare for this uh, it's because i came up with it in the middle of this episode because i once again forgot uh that we do these so today the wacky segment of the week question is if you had to pick one sport for maple to attend every single game of and essentially be the live mascot of as she's taking a nap right behind us. If you're unfamiliar, Maple is Connor's cat and also our live mascot. Where's Maple going? What sport is Maple always attending? Maybe even on the head of Willie the Wildcat. 
You see, in a perfect world, I'd say football, but I think she'd get really scared and never be seen again. <laughs> so I can't say football. And I think for similar reasons, it can't be men's basketball or women's basketball. Um, I think the best option for Maple is probably going to be a quiet sport. Okay. I'm thinking she would have a lot of fun with golf either men's or women's golf uh, there's a chance that rowing would work if we could get her into a watertight compartment good luck with that pal but uh, that would be a quieter sport but golf is going to be closest i think to something that's her speed um if sound wasn't an issue um i would consider women's basketball uh so maybe we could get her some cat earplugs. Some cat earplugs, yeah. Or something like that. But I, I don't think she'd tolerate that much either. Well, I actually was originally going to say women's cats could ball as well. And the main reason why was because Willie was just going to hold her as if she were his his child. And he would keep her safe. But nevertheless still motivate everyone. And perhaps even use Maple as a distraction tool on free throws by holding her up like Simba. You see, I think that'd be really funny. In a perfect world where she would tolerate that, I think that'd be very funny. She, damn, you're right, she doesn't like being held. She'll sit on a lap, though. That's true. So if Willie just sits there peacefully, <laughs> peacefully behind the basket, that could still be a distraction in some ways. But just no lifting. No lifting. Maybe we get her a throne, like a like an like a soundproof chamber. And give her a throne. That would be something to see. I'm not gonna let this turn into the Sphinx discussion. We're done here. <laughs> you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, I don't. All right. Well, that's the case. Thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. If you want to follow or contact the show, you can follow us just about anywhere at Aggieville ACATS. If you want to email us, we're AggievilleAlleyCats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us more personally, I am at acedward 0 I am at Connor Balthazor, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store. Link in our podcast description and our Twitter bio. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. Stay safe, Alley Cats.